everyone and welcome to the conversation. We are the City of Vidosi Youth Advisory Committee. My name's Kai and my pronouns are they and she. I'm Sharon and my pronouns are she and her. And I'm Queen and my pronouns are she, her. As part of the 16 days of activism, today we'll be having a conversation around violence against women. Uh, the domestic violence through the lens of the LGBT perspective. And um, seeing and identifying red flags in a relationship. In 2021, Respect Victoria and Domestic Violence Victoria slash Domestic Violence Resource Centre Victoria are partnering to deliver and support local engagement in the 16 Days of Activism Grassroots Initiative. The City of Whitlesey has been funded through this initiative. The City of Whittlesey recognizes the rich Aboriginal heritage of this country and acknowledges the Wurundjeri Willem clan as the traditional custodians of this land. Uh, before I pass on to Sharin, I would just like to say that throughout today's conversation, there will be a lot of discussion around some of the issues facing young people today. These include things like domestic violence, family violence, sexual assault and abuse. These are important discussions, but we acknowledge that certain topics like these may be triggering may be triggering for some people. Please make sure to look after yourselves throughout today's conversation and reach out to a support service listed in the conversation description if needed. I would also like to acknowledge that everyone's experience is unique to them and the opinions and views shared in today's conversation are individual to the three of us and may not necessarily reflect the experiences, views and opinions held by all City of Whittlesea staff, working groups, young people and community members. Hello everyone. So I want to begin with a little insight on why we're doing this podcast. As part of our 16 days of activism, gender-based violence campaign, we thought it's an appropriate time for us to open up discussion around violence against women in hopes that it might reach the ears of those wanting to learn and people who can personally relate and might need these resources that we want to provide. We want you to know that you're not alone in this and help is always around you. So gender-based violence. When I said those three words, queen, did you wonder whether I'm talking about male or female identifying genders? Yeah, I honestly, when I hear those three words, that is what I think. Think that it's um, probably about women? Females, yeah, sorry. Yeah. yeah, so we don't really need to clarify, further clarify that it's women who are central to this <coughs> issue. And I think that's the problem here, isn't it? Violence against women, it's so frequent yeah. that it's, it's assumed. So yeah. according, according to uh, the 16 Days of Activism Toolkit in Australia, a woman is killed every nine days by her former partner. Can we imagine losing someone we know like every nine days? A neighbour, nearby baker, a teacher, your workmate, your uh, childhood friend, your driving instructor, local shopkeeper. Yeah, that would be horrible. horrible. Yeah, yeah. Like I feel like the further away the statistic is, the more desensitized that we become and it's frightening like when you personalize it knowing that it's so close to home in today's world toxic masculinity happens to be the antagonist for women's safety this inclusion is tough to ask for on a gender-based violence issue to include all genders in the conversation so how how do you think we can include everyone in this conversation um i think that like you said before this Type, these types of conversations are mostly surrounded by women or more feminine people and I think for us to be inclusive uh, we really need to focus on everyone that's involved in these types of um, violence and acts because I mean at the end of the day there's a whole bunch of contributing factors about you know what happens and when it happens and how it happens and I think that in order for us to have that accurate representation, we need to really, um, we, we need to really focus on all perspectives and all people that, you know, want to be included and want their voice to be heard. Not just the women that have experienced these things, but also, you know, m men that are perpetrators or, you know, 
anyone that um, has had anything to do with these kinds of things. I think we also need to remove a lot of the stigma around men like being feminist or men experiencing these things or just like men be or male identifying people like being in the conversation at all it's really stigmatized idea for no reason at all i feel like the more frequently the abuse takes place the frequency of these conversations have to proportionately increase with it right and Mm -hmm. as queen said to remove any attached stigma um keep talking about it until the conversation of the wrongdoing is more normalized than the wrong the wrongdoing. Yeah, I think that, you know, as we start to have these conversations, obviously they're going to be uncomfortable. They're going to be uncomfortable for everyone, for the perpetrators, for the victims. Um, and especially in, you know, this day and age where victim blaming is such a, you know, acute problem. And that's always the very first thing that people go to. Like the, it's always the questions of were you drunk? What were you wearing? Those kinds of things. Um, And I think we really need to, as we have these uncomfortable conversations, they're going to become less uncomfortable the more that we talk about them. Um, So, yeah, I think it is really important that we talk about these things and that everyone talks about these things because then it's just going to make it easier, you know. I, I agree. And I feel like I relate this topic so much to mental health just just for that reason, right, because I feel like a couple of years back, if someone was, uh, there was so much stigma surrounding mental health. If someone was um, depressed, uh, anxious, it it, it was kind of like something that they need to be ashamed of. And I feel like that's where we are now with domestic violence, domestic abuse and uh, violence against women, right? If uh, I feel like not a lot of women still feel comfortable um, uh, to come forward with these stories. And it's just, the, the way that we fought against uh, the stigma around mental health is we kept talking about it and talking about it and people ca- yeah. came forward again and again and again. And now it's like, it's sort of like normalized, right? Like the conversations yeah. around mental health, like people normally bring it up in our conversations. I, I said like um, so many times, like, oh my God, I'm feeling anxious today. Um, and I feel mm. like a lot of my friends have as well. It's just these words have become incorporated into our language. And I think it, to some extent, w- knowing our boundaries, of course, that is what we need to do with um, violence against women. Like we just need to keep talking about it and talking about it until there comes a day when um, all the stigma, the victim blaming, all of that just eradicates itself. Yeah. yeah. I completely agree. I guess adding on to that, there's this uh, stat that I got from Australian Institute of Criminology in uh, 2020. Two thirds of women have experienced physical or sexual violence by a current or former cohabiting partner since the start of the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, So they've said that the violence has started or escalated, increasing in frequency or severity. When I heard this, I got, I literally got goosebumps, like the bad kind when I, you know, um, it's just, I guess it's the state of helplessness that we feel for these women trapped in isolation in their toxic homes. Queen and Kai, like what was your immediate response upon hearing this awful statistic? You know, the first thing that I, you know, always think about when, we're talking about domestic violence or any kind of family violence is always, um, you know, people that stay out of their houses, like their, their family homes for as long as possible. You know, they're getting jobs, they're going to after school programs just so that they don't have to be home and be around, you know, the perpetrators of their violence. And, you know, the first thing that I, that my mind went to was, you know, during the pandemic, we weren't allowed to go anywhere. We were allowed to, we were allowed outside for a walk, two hours a day and that was about it like I can't even imagine what it was like to go through something like that especially when there was no escape there was no kind of you know outlet there was nowhere to go apart from home to the perpetrator of this abuse like it's it's something really scary to think about and especially because that statistic was so high like two-thirds is over 60 percent of people so that's yeah that's a lot yeah, they must have felt like really hopeless and helpless because there was no one to tell and nowhere to go and no one to help them. And this is why we really need to spread more information and awareness of these people's situations and 
give them more resources so that they have someone to reach out to. Yeah, I agree. Um, it's like, I think it's when you we see these um, hard hitting facts, we realize like how um, the things that we see on the news like when I when I saw this, my immediate reaction actually was, um, how did I hear about the toilet paper hole like every day and not this? Like, well, at least why not both? You know, the yeah. statistic was actually also obtained around the same time as the whole panic buying thing. And even after like the whole, um, the, what do you call it? The media frenzy, I guess you could say, on the whole toilet paper hole, even after it passed, they were still talking about it, the media. But this, mm. this huge thing which was happening, it, like, why why not? Why, why not, like, keep bringing it up? Like, do you, do you think the media finds this topic too heavy or too ongoing? Like, why, why, why do you think, why do you think this happens? Like, why do you think the mainstream media often shies away from having this conversation? I think, you know, as progressive as, you know, our society as a whole wants to say we are and we are there's been so much progression since you know the days of um you know outright discrimination against people but I think nowadays we've got into that point where um people are scared to talk about these things you know in fear that they'd say the wrong thing in fear that you know there'd be some kind of backlash and especially in you know, the day where everyone has, you know, most people have a mobile phone, like a laptop for school, an iPad, you know, some sort of electronic device that probably has social media on it. I think, you know, our we're starting to we're starting to have so much trouble with especially things like our attention span and things like that. Hard hitting media like is a is a thing of the past. Like they want things that are going to like make you laugh or make you say oh or something like that as opposed to something as hard hitting as statistics like that and I think when the day that social media and the big news corporations want to stop talking about the novelties and start talking about you know the real things that we need to talk about I think that's the day that you know we make some real progress and some steps towards some uh, proper change. So I think um, many people in abusive and toxic relationships are unaware of the signs um, of an abusive and toxic relationship. And young people especially who are starting to enter relationships can also be unaware of them because it's so dangerous for them to be entering these relationships and starting new friendships and stuff and not really understanding how um, or what red flags are and how they can affect their mental health and their physical well-being um it's just that people need to know and see the signs in order to call it out or get out of an abusive relationship also that abuse isn't limited to um physical abuse and it can be psychological and emotional too and people don't really know that your partner could be manipulating gaslighting and emotionally scarring you without you even realizing and a lot of people they blame um women for staying in abusive relationships but they don't understand that some people don't see it as abusive and they don't understand that it can be a really hard mindset to get out of that it's normal oh yeah I wanted to chime in like you know (laughs) um the you said gaslighting before yeah. Um. I don't know about you guys, but I feel like the the whole concept of gaslighting it's kind of like new. Uh, well, at least to me, like it, it wasn't like a popular term. Um, it wasn't a popular term. Uh, like let's yeah. say like even a year back. Like, but now it has been popularized by about like, it. platforms yeah. such as TikTok and Instagram. Yeah, it, has. it is. It's like it's, it's like people mention it all the time, and it's so good. Uh, do you maybe have an example of what gaslighting? Yeah, yeah. Like? It's like um, someone like trying to make themselves seem like the victim, I guess, and tr- making you doubt your own beliefs and what you think and like kind of a form of manipulating you into thinking that they are 
what's good for you and they correct and you're wrong and you're like it kind of makes you feel like you're going crazy in your own head Mm. yeah and it's like a horrible way of making someone stay with you or just do what you want yeah if that Mm -hmm. makes sense I feel like this happens uh between friends as well and I don't know like it's so it sounds like pretty common like a lot of us would have experienced there but then I feel like this is one of those emotions like when like like two years back I wouldn't have known what to call it um and now it's like it's so yeah. good that we're all recognizing the signs yeah I think that's really common especially you know in the young people age group I guess 15 to 25 um and not just in like romantic slash sexual sexual relationships but like also in friendships and stuff like that like a lot of us don't know the a lot of us don't know the you know the signs and you know you always get that question of why didn't you leave like why did you stay with this person why were you so friends yeah. with this person after they had done so much like done so much to you and like the pretty simple answer is I didn't know like I didn't know yeah. what was happening I didn't know that that was bad I didn't know that that wasn't normal like there's so much and I think it all goes back to stigma as well. Like there's so much stigma and no one wants to talk about these kinds of things. Mm-hmm. So no one knows about them. Yeah. And it's just kind of like a cycle of like, um, why didn't you leave? I didn't know. Okay. Then let's not talk about it. Then other people won't know. You know what I mean? It's like, um, and people can get emotionally attached to it as well. And they can think, oh, I can't like people can make you think oh you know you can't live without me this you're nothing without me you know it's just another Mm. form of manipulation and abuse that people don't even realize it's abuse yeah and I think maybe because of um you know because we didn't know about you know the the extent and the meaning of gaslighting um yeah before it, it was interchangeable with you know just stupid you're you feel just so stupid for not seeing the signs and yeah. maybe that they might have felt like really embarrassed to talk about it with their friends or family because like, oh, I was just so, you know, um, short-sighted. Yeah. Like, how could I not have realized that? And then now there's the term like, oh, okay, I was gaslighted. Yeah. And it's just another form of um, manipulation. Most women who are in abusive relationships or just people many years thought that it was behavior was normal as we were saying before or a way of life and even when they did realize they might not have the financial or emotional support to get out of this relationship a lot of toxic relationships can be codependent so you have you have this one person who may have like purposefully cut out everyone in your life to make it that they you only need them and they only need you in some horrible way. And yeah, this is really common and not a lot of people know about it. I think yeah. that's also the most dangerous as well, because like, you know, try, trying to see it from their perspective, it, it might even look like you're jumping out of one hellfire in, onto another, you know, because yeah. you're like leaving one really risky and toxic situation but then you don't know where to turn to you don't know where to go um maybe the victims they don't have any financial support emotional support like in employment like how can they support themselves like will they become will they be homeless like what if they can't survive out there you know yeah. so they're, just, they're just there like it's really it's horrible and like i said before red flags that can turn into um uh, escalate into abuse do you guys um want to point out some red flags that you know um, of? yeah so you know some of the things that even like some of the things that my friends have said to me that I've kind of done a double take and gone yeah that, that doesn't sound quite right to me that doesn't sound very healthy um but you know some of the things like you know I had a friend once who would used to sulk at her every time that she would talk to one of her friends whether they were male, male female like any gender like they didn't care they would sulk and yell every time um Mm. you know being unreasonably jealous for no reason um you know and then I had you know a few other friends who felt like they were scared of their partner they couldn't say certain things around their partner because they were scared of you know what their reaction was going to be or what they were going to say and all these things and I think one of the main very common ones that I hear about the most is 
that form of manipulation that you were talking about before. But yeah, those are some of the main ones that I've heard about personally. Um, you know, I wanted to ask, like, have you guys read Wattpad when you were younger? Yeah. yeah yeah and you know um I don't know if you know the stories that I'm talking about like I remember when I was like 15 16 there was like always that alpha male um yeah like, alpha like a wolf or you know these stories where like the men are always so aggressive like they would you know shove um grab grab the female like it, yeah. it was just really really um like whoa like now thinking back to it, it's like whoa and then now again thinking back to it it's like these books are still being read by like a really young audience yeah and they find this sort of like possessive behavior um, attractive yeah yeah and And I think that all I think that all circles back to you know stigma and that kind of thing because you know if we're if we had been openly talking about these kinds of things, like, you know, from, for ages, no, everyone would be sitting here and realizing that those kinds of people are not, you know, are not healthy people. They're toxic and having a relationship with those kinds of people is toxic. Like, um, and I think, yeah, I think if this conversation was had more and, um, you know, it was more extensive, then people would be able to recognize that a lot of people, you know, back to the victim blaming kind of thing. I feel like a lot of people that have experienced domestic violence or family violence have, um, or, you know, violence within relationships have, you know, a a victim blaming themselves in a way, Um, Mm -hmm. you know, like that kind of thing where, oh, I didn't cook dinner right for him. Um, Yeah. I like, I deserve to be hit or, you know, those kinds of things. And I think, in turn, breaking down, you know, gender stereotypes, you know, the women belong in the kitchen, the men belong at work, like those kinds of things. I think that will go a long way in us being able to openly talk about these things, you know, more and more extensively. Here's another statistic. Um, Almost two thirds of women who say they have never been in an abusive relationship have experienced toxic behavior. A survey of 122,000 women conducted by Women's Aid found that over a third, um, aka 34.5%, said they have been, they had been in an abusive relationship at some point, but out of the 65.5% of respondents who said they had never been in an abusive relationship, almost two thirds had experienced problematic toxic behavior from a partner, which could potentially amount to abuse. And I just found that statistic really, like, eye-opening because, like, if they had stayed in those relationships where they had seen those red flags that we had just discussed, you can see how easily it can become a toxic and abusive relationship that could be so hard to get out of. It could just, you know, like, a little bit more, I guess, conditioning to the, um, to these horrible techniques that they use on you. And they would be in it for a really long time. They don't come out, you know, guns are blazing, you know, as soon as they ask you to be their partner, they're, you know, beating you up or uh, um, verbally abusing you. That abuse is gradual and it works itself up. It doesn't start as, you know, a full on fist fight. It doesn't start as, you know, that overt, um, form of abuse it starts at that covert like you know snarky comments possessiveness Mm -hmm. all the little things that we've been talking about and it builds up over so many years so you know it's been two years down the track and you're like how did I end up like this how did I get this way like how how have we gone so wrong what have I done to you know to cause this to make this so much worse than what it used to be like I think that's one of the big things and one of the really scary things, because, you know, you notice that those small toxic things and then, you know, the possibilities after that are just really frightening and really scary. Yeah, I agree so much with that, Kai. Um, you know, because I feel like a lot of people ask, like, um, victims of domestic abuse, like, why didn't you just leave? Right. Like that's that's a pretty overplayed question that they asked. Um, yeah. And I feel like a lot of people like believe that okay so domestic violence like it's something that's so immediate and the signs like are just there from the get-go that's not it is it um it's always like 
not always, of course, but in a lot of、uh, circumstances, they are very sweet. They are very affectionate and kind、mm-hmm. and loving at the start. That's what makes、um, these、uh, the victims like really so attached and perhaps even in love with them, right? And then once the signs starts to show, it's hard to leave someone that you've formed that bond with. Yeah, and that's what makes it easy to ignore.、Mm-hmm. Just because we're talking about psychological abuse doesn't mean that some people don't realize that、um, physical abuse is just as bad. So threatening you or using violence against you and hurting you in any way is obviously, well, to some people, a red flag. Yeah, and I think also isolating you from. You know, communities and family、yeah. and friends, right? Because,、um, like, if you're alone, it just—I feel like it just emasculates them a lot more. They、um, put you down, like they make you feel bad about yourself. No partner should ever do that. Like, either by attacking your looks, your Capabilities, your intelligence. Either way, like they're supposed to lift you up,、mm. not make you feel bad. Yeah, you know? big yeah. red flag. A hundred percent. And you know, I think、um, a lot of these signs are also experienced by individuals in the LGBT plus community, and then. On top of that, they're also forced to deal with these things, you know, with little support from other people.、Um, and I think the LGBT plus community don't have often don't have that really strong means of support during these times of hardship, and there's often no support system for them to lean on when they're in dire need of that support. And I think, you know, that's. So upsetting because you know there's so many there's so many things that could be done for you know people in the community and I think it's really such a shame that not as much effort I guess is being put into it.、Um, and then on top of that, there's so many as、um, we've discussed, particularly with Queen.、Um, there's so many kinds of abuse. There's you know spiritual abuse, physical, sexual, emotional, psychological, and then there's also financial and economic on top of that. And you know, I was reading through the Victorian population of the of health, the Victorian population population health survey、um, the other day, and I found that thirteen point four percent of LGBT plus people in Victoria answered that they were currently experiencing or had experienced family violence in the last two years. And then on top of that, of this thirteen point four percent, eighty four point four percent had experienced violence. That was repeated over several occasions. So I was、That's、just wondering because you seem really like you you are I know you are very、uh, well versed on this topic. So I wanted your insight. Like, why do you think the LGBTQ plus、um, community are so vulnerable to、uh, family violence? One of the main things that、um, has caused this is that being someone in the LGBT plus community is still such. A taboo thing, I guess. Like, yes, we're having so many more people coming out, and we're having so many more, you know, people being expressive with their identity and being proud of who they are. And I'm so glad about that. But there are also still so, so many people, not just in Victoria, not just in Australia, but around the whole world, that are still, you know, part of this marginalized、yeah. group and still experience discrimination. And that's not necessarily on. You know, a public scale. That's not necessarily, you know,、um, being assaulted because you identify a certain way or because you、um, use certain pronouns or something like that. But I'm also talking about, you know, those slight comments that your family members make, like, "Oh, that's a bit weird," or "That's a bit this," or "That's a bit that."、Um, and I think a lot of people, on some sort of level, are. Embarrassed of you know how they identify, and they're embarrassed of being. Hey, my significant other, I think is abusing me, or I think there's something wrong with our relationship because, like, they're not they're not necessarily open about those kinds of things. And I think that especially since、um, 
since a lot of people, there are still a lot of people in the community that aren't openly out to like their schools or their parents or their friends. I think that that also isolates them a lot because they don't have that support support system. They don't have those safe people um, that they can confide in or that they can get advice from or anything like that. So I think that, you know, these significant, these statistics are so significant because of a bunch of factors that have accumulated together to um you know create this thank you thank you for that insight Kai. like i i definitely agree with you i think it's like the layering of two huge huge issues um because like there are issues that lgbtq um plus community people are currently still facing and on top of that we're talking about family violence domestic violence which is also a huge issue and it's that layering which I feel like is really um yeah as you said isolating this community yeah I think that it is such a big problem and especially because of that layering like you said um I think a lot of people don't necessarily know how to approach it in a way that is one you know, inclusive of everyone and then is also actually doing some sort of good for the community and these victims um, of the things that have taken place. Um, And, you know, especially since, you know, 13.4% is a a big difference to um, the 5.1% of those, of people in that survey um, that were not LGBT plus. who had experienced family violence and obviously this isn't this isn't the um the oppression olympics or anything like that but that's that's a significant difference between you know the rates of domestic violence within lgbt plus community and the rates of domestic violence within the non lgbt plus people um but yeah i think it's a big thing that we have to talk about and yeah, really start to destigmatize these kinds of issues. You know, how LGBT plus people aren't really taught about the healthy sides of a relationship. All they all they're seeing is, you know, the things that they're that they 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 think that they're meant to have or the things that they think is the best option. And that option isn't as healthy as they think it is. Because, you know, they're just taking whatever they can get at that point because they're like, there's nothing better for me out there. There's nothing, you know, more healthier. There's nothing, um, like, better that I can experience. And I think, you know, that also relates to, like, you know, schools and sexual education within schools. And, um, you know, at my school, I didn't receive any sort of, you know, relationship education. Um, But, yeah, I think it all comes down to that stigma, I think, if, you know, being gay or being queer or being intersex or being who, like whoever you want to identify as, I think if that was destigmatized, then there'd be a lot more open conversation, which would lead to a lot more um, services and a lot more, um, a lot more ability for people to reach out for those support systems that they really need when they really need the support. You know, a lot of these things that we're being, a lot of these issues that we've been talking about as we've discussed um, are rooted in, you know, gender stereotypes or gender norms, I guess. Yeah. Um, and within same-sex relationships, these things don't necessarily apply. Like how, like you can't, there's there's no way for people to distinguish between like, um, like, you know, the man of the relationship who's meant to be going to work or the woman in the relationship who's meant to be in the kitchen. Like, the, it's really hard to distinguish between those toxic behaviours and those healthy behaviours because there's they're not a heterosexual couple. They don't know, um, you know, one person may not realise that the perpetrator of this violence is, is you know, acting in um, a way that promotes toxic masculinity or a way that promotes the like oppression the oppressive nature of femininity even though um even though that's that's not the case because you know these people they don't know how to discern between you know healthy and toxic in a same-sex relationship compared to a um a heterosexual relationship in that same uh survey the victorian population health survey um, 21.6% of LGBT plus people stated that they didn't seek any kind of support, any kind of services, 
you know, for them support. They didn't go to the police. They didn't seek out helplines. They didn't seek out friends or family. They didn't, you know, seek out a psychologist, a therapist, or anyone. Um, and I think that's, you know, that's a huge proportion of people that had no way to cope with their stresses. They had no, you know, outlet for the, for the things that they were experiencing. They had no sort of um, support system like that other people get because, you know, they don't experience, because they don't have to experience the discrimination that the LGBT plus community has to experience, not has to, but is, you know, subjected to. Um, and yeah, I just think it's a really big thing that we need to, I think it's been, that's been a really, you know, tough session guys. I hope everyone's, um, I hope everyone's coping. Okay. Um, particularly, particularly our listeners. Um, but yeah, that's been a lot and I hope that you guys gain something out of that. Um, but yeah, I've had a lot of fun talking to you guys today about these things even if they're not necessarily some fun topics to talk about and I'm sure there were points when um there were points where you know we're all a bit uncomfortable um but yeah I just want everyone to know that there's always a place for you to go youth beyond blue who have the phone number 1300 22 4636 um and there's also other sites like eheadspace and kids helpline who also have um the phone number 1-800-55-1-800 um but yeah oh just to you know um mention a couple more as well the the orange door northern casa elizabeth morgan house for indigenous women um and the gatehouse center and domestic violence resource center victoria so there are so many resources available. Um, just feel, please, no, don't feel like you're in this alone. You've got yeah. a community. Also to everyone, this is an ongoing conversation that people should encourage friends and family and colleagues to have and participate in so that we can continue to spread awareness and help those in need. Yeah, I think it's really important that we keep you know, this isn't a one-time conversation. I think it's really important that we all keep um, talking about these things because then, you know, that's just, as I've said so many times today, um, that's just going to lead to the destigmatization of these things and it's going to make these conversations a lot easier in the future. And then that's going to lead to a lot more help for victims and a lot more help for perpetrators and all those kinds of things. So, yeah, I really do hope that today that, you know, everyone listening has gotten something out of today. And that, you know, you go off and have maybe this conversation with your parents or your friends or, you know, or at least you've learned something. Just to add to that, we need to continue to advocate for women um, and domestic violence victims outside of the 16 days of activism. So make Uh this not just limited to two weeks, but then an ongoing conversation that we all continue to have push for because we we've, we've saw today i mean not so you you heard today how scary and hard hitting the statistics are and especially during the times of pandemic lockdown how horrible it has been for many people so we we it's not it's not them against us it's us you know we we need to fight for you know us yeah 100 absolutely yeah so yeah but thank you for listening everyone i hope you all yeah. have a great yeah. day a great night a great afternoon Go have some warm tea. Day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah make sure you look after yourselves yeah bye have a nice day bye, bye.